Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to ask, wow, I think there's a bit of an echo here. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Josh Campbell. I am the face behind the emails you guys have been getting. Uh, I am the CEO of Techonomy and excited to be here uh, with Wipro hosting a series of conversations about tech's impact on business and society. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Techonomy, we host a series of events back in the United States, uh, one in New York in May, one in Half Moon Bay, California, uh, focused again on, on broadly how technology is transforming the world. Uh, additionally, we publish a print magazine. We don't believe print is dead yet. So we encourage all of you to grab one on the way out. David and I don't want to carry them back to New York. So, um, and I will give a plug that we'll hear a little later from Kaifu and Brad. Um, we have an article in the magazine uh, about uh, Carol Ann and Brad's book. Uh, so we encourage you to grab this. Um, you know, really again, I think tonight, today, uh, tomorrow morning, we've been facilitating these conversations and hope you'll join us. The session will be live streamed, so if you are tweeting, please use hashtag Davos Direct. Uh, Techonomy, I am losing my voice only after two days of Davos, so that's not a great thing. But without further ado, I want to bring up uh, Brad, Kaifu, and David to start the conversation, so thank you again. Okay, gentlemen, please join me. So good to have everybody here. Uh, as Josh said, I'm David Kirkpatrick with Techonomy, and uh, two former Techonomy conference speakers together on stage. We're very happy about that. I, you know, our session's title is Tech Responsibility and the Future of Society, and I think anyone who, like me, is a veteran Davos goer has to be struck by the way the tone has shifted, particularly this year, around responsibility and particularly climate. Um, plus, I think another issue which has been very prominent in recent years but continues to be is the responsibility of tech platforms that are perceived in many cases to be causing social harm. Kaifu and I were just at a session where uh, Tristan Harris and Yuval Harari were talking about that at some length and that was the sole topic of their discussion. Um, and I want to get to that in a minute. But to start, I wanted to ask Brad to talk about this extraordinary announcement that he spearheaded for Microsoft last week uh, to say that not only would it continue to be carbon neutral as it has been, but to take this e extraordinarily responsible step of saying Microsoft was going to become carbon negative, essentially suck up all the equivalent of all the carbon its existence has ever led to, and then going forward continue to be carbon negative going into the 2050 time frame. That really has to be said as an extraordinary responsible act. And so how did it happen? Why did it happen? And you know, thank you. Um, well, you're welcome. We did it for you, David. Uh, well, you did it for all of us, I'd say. <laughs> um, well, first I have to say, uh, having spent a lot of time over the last few months on this issue, um, it was an extraordinary education for me. And to some degree, I feel like you know, there's an extraordinary uh, educational opportunity and really need, uh, you know, more broadly for the world. Uh, you know, today, uh, humanity emits more than 50 uh, billion uh, metric tons of greenhouse gases every year. Um, you know, we're going to have to get that down to net zero, certainly by 2050. If there's any hope of constraining the increase in temperature on the planet. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I learned is just, you know, like a lot of problems, uh, they're obscured by vocabulary. Uh, and so, you know, part of what I came away really appreciating is, you know, what it means to be carbon neutral or what it means to think about net zero. Um, you might think they mean the same thing, that net neutral and net zero are the same thing. Uh, but in fact, the way a lot of companies use these terms are actually quite different. Um, you know, we were, uh, we've been carbon, uh, we've been net neutral, carbon neutral at Microsoft since 2012, and we were proud of that. Um, and, you know, one of the conclusions I came to was, yeah, we probably should not be so proud of that. Um, you know, really for two reasons. One, we were uh, applying that based on only uh, our own emissions, our own direct em emissions and our, our um, uh, electricity consumption and our travel, but not our supply chain, not our so-called value chain. Uh, but the second is um, you know, we were counting towards net neutrality what most companies 
uh, count towards being uh, neutral, uh, which is uh, avoided emissions. You know, what's an avoided mis emission? If I go to David and then say, David, you have a lot of, you have some big trees in your backyard. I'm going to pay you not to cut those down. That's a good thing. We don't want people to cut down trees. Um, and that you know, would avoid a loss of certain carbon emissions. And then that would be counted towards being neutral. But we're not going to solve this problem by paying people just to do nothing. We've got to do something. So in short, what we really tried to do was look at all of the emissions for which we're responsible, not just directly, but from the beginning of our supply chain to the end of our value chain, meaning if you buy an Xbox and you use it, you're using electricity and that may be generated by the emission of carbon. Uh, we would stop talking about net neutral, we would get to net zero, meaning we would actually actively remove as much carbon as we emit across all of that, and then we would keep going farther. And you know, as you can imagine, it's one thing to have a big goal and say you're going to commit to it. It's quite another to have a detailed plan that gives you confidence that you can meet that goal, and that's really what we work to put together. Have you been surprised at the impact that that announcement has had? Because it really has, I think, generated an enormous amount of attention and, and, uh, and respect. Um, I haven't been surprised, but I've been pleased. And I will say, as much as anything, we really made it a goal to try to start to change the conversation. Um, not by anybody saying, oh, isn't it nice that this one company is doing something good. You know, our, I, you know, there's other companies that have got, done great things. There are other companies that will surpass us. We will learn from them, and we will all make each other better. But more than anything, we really just wanted to, to you know, as I'm sort of trying, obviously, to describe here, um, broaden the dialogue so that we all raise our ambition. And we can't actually do that unless we have a common vocabulary and then ultimately a common way to measure how we're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, Kai Fu and I were just at this session I mentioned, and as we were walking back over here together, um, we were talking about this question of what happens. What do you really do about Facebook and Google's information impact, especially the negative parts of it, which is most pronounced with Facebook and YouTube? Um, and before I ask the question, Kai Fu is an AI leading thinker, computer scientist, and investor now in Beijing, but he's worked at Apple, Microsoft, Google, and now running his own investment firm based in Beijing and wrote his great book called AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. But he was suggesting some ways that this problem of <coughs> political disinformation and fake news could be remedied. And interestingly, when I want you to quickly talk about that, but the thing that I found so great was you could really summarize the way you were thinking of it as those companies ought to think about disinformation the same way that Microsoft is thinking about carbon. Mm -hmm. That they need to not only stop doing it, but figure out ways to suck up its failures that have been cumulative so far. So anyway, what would you say, Kai-Fu, you think, when you look at this landscape, having been a practitioner for so long, global perspective, what's going wrong and how can we fix that? Uh, I think what's going on is even worse than people's fears right now because uh, we have this, in addition to the issues of the ability to target specific people, um, and, and you know, this information has always existed, but now with AI, it can be targeted differently depending on each person. And it's furthermore linked to the company's profit and bottom line. So even if companies wanted to say, well, let's be more responsible, every change, every tweak, causes them to, to make less money, so it's more difficult to do. Um, another issue is new technologies are also being invented for further uh, misinformation, deep fake being the most prominent. And it is my belief as an uh, AI practitioner that deep fakes, uh, it'll play out, right? People are trying to catch deep fakes, there are more of them, prevent them. It is my belief that in five or six years, they will be uncatchable because the very nature of the uh, generative adversarial networks is that if you have a way to catch them, they'll use it to train it to not be caught. So this is even worse, and OpenAI and other companies recently demonstrated the ability to generate this 
content and news that looks not quite human, but more and more sensible. And imagine in the future, if the machine, if some evil company, I mean, Google and Facebook wouldn't do this, but if some bad company or entity would target each individual by generating a specific um, content that hits the vulnerability of that person. So those are all the issues down the line. Uh, how to address it, uh, I, I'm actually more of an optimist than uh, Tristan and um, Yuval on technological solutions. Because historically, uh, you know, when we had all these viruses uh, that were infecting our PCs, we didn't just say shut the PCs down, disconnect them from the internet. Uh, people eventually came up with antivirus software, which has the property of the user doesn't have to understand it, and it basically works. People trusted the software. So technological problems could, are generally solved by technological solutions. Right? When electricity was invented, um, uh, basically it was dangerous. People could get electrocuted at home. But then people invented circuit breakers. Then they became safe. So I like to think there will be circuit breakers and antivirus software for, um, for, the, for, for the, this kind of issue, uh, for example, uh, using uh, <clears throat> different types of um, federated learning so that your data is not necessarily uploaded uh, while the AI benefits can, can, be rema can remain uh, or homomorphic encryption and derivative technologies that, that en encrypts what you, you, some of your information. So those are things people are working on. They may or may not work, but if we have a system where people are innovating, that could work. Now, coming back to companies like Facebook, uh, I, I actually believe they're making progress. Uh, I do wish they would um, uh, uh, externalize the progress that they are likely to have made. They've talked about you know, 2 billion accounts being deleted, fake accounts being deleted. That's definitely a good thing. But as you know, every tech company has uh, metrics. When I worked at Google, there were very clear metrics on relevance, coverage, response time, and the team religiously measures them uh, week to week, month to month, to show things are getting better. And there's no reason why uh, social networks that, that uh, basically do targeted news feeds cannot have some internal metric and externalize that. Well, you're saying they almost certainly do have internal metrics on fake news, but they should tell us what that metric is, that is showing. I'm sure yeah. They're, yeah. they're working on it, but yeah. if they somehow could show it and earn more trust, I think maybe a positive cycle could be formed. Yeah. The other solution I could imagine is that I think the temptation today for, for companies that uh, make money by eyeballs is how can you resist the temptation to target um, each individual by causing them to click more because every click and every minute causes you to make more money. But I think the issue is uh, significant enough that one, might, one should start to investigate other metrics than click-throughs and minutes. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I'm a little confused because if, if uh, deep fakes are gonna be undetectable, yeah. and yet software you're confident will emerge that allows the companies to keep these systems relatively cleaner, do you think that would apply to deep fakes as well, despite their quote unquote undetectability? I do think deep fakes eventually are, are detectable, okay, actually. Good. But right. then you would need to basically uh, use something like blockchain to, yeah. from the time of capture okay. of every video. Okay, and cool. that's going to take over Just a decade. I wanted to make sure that wasn't a contradiction. Now, Brad, your book was called Tools and Weapons, which you wrote with Carol Ann Brown, who's sitting in the front. Thank you, Carol Ann. Um, you called it that. Just say why you called it that and tie into what Kaifu was just talking about. Well, I think I know it, it's relevant. Yeah, it's obviously digital technology uh, has long been a very valuable and important tool. It's helping us do all kinds of great things around the world, and it should continue to do that. But it has been weaponized, um, in some cases almost literally as a weapon for cyber attacks, um, but also more broadly, it's, it's, you know, we, we live in this age of anxiety, and when you really think about what people are worried about, a lot of it is you know, something that is grounded in technological change. Uh, I think that you know, that combination of labels you know, certainly fits when we're talking about the challenges to democracy. Um, Which I, you write about a lot in your book. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to start by recognizing um, that roughly half the world's population lives in one of the 76 nations that The Economist at least qualified and classified last year as a democracy. Um, and, and yet, you know, democracy, I think, is less healthy. That's what The Economist concludes, and in many ways, it's under attack and under threat. 
If you think about the, this description that we just had, I think it really you know, helps us define some of what we need to do to protect democracy. Uh, we have these three kinds of attacks that we have seen. One is really hacking uh, candidates, campaigns, weaponizing email as a result. A second is potential attacks on voting systems, voter rolls, and the like. And the third is disinformation. And you know, the, the, I think this point on measurement of disinformation uh, you know, is especially important because in some ways it's the most amorphous. And certainly deep fakes are sort of like the next generation of technology uh, when it comes to being able to engage in disinformation. Um, but we have these two other aspects that I think go to uh, really what is uh, at the foundation of what one needs to have a healthy democracy. Um, one thing we need that I think we're going to have to talk more about is healthy journalism. You know, it really yeah. is, it's the fourth estate for a reason. And, and let's face it, journalism is less healthy today because technology has disrupted it. And I, I think that's one of the big questions for this decade. But the other thing that is interesting, and, and, and you, you get at it when you talk about targeting. Yeah, I think democracy doesn't obviously require that everybody have the same opinion. People don't. But at a certain level, it does depend on people having a common exposure to the news of the day, to the facts that are being debated. Um, and in most countries, you know, that happened through what was a relatively limited but hopefully robust you know, number of newspapers, magazines, television networks, what you will. But with business models that encourage very precise targeting of people based in part on what they believe, you end up creating what you know, we sort of refer to as cyber tribes. You know, in one circle, you're reading and hearing about one thing. In another circle, you're hearing and reading about something else. And you know, one of the best measurements so far actually came in a very interesting way. In the United States, the Senate Intelligence Committee used its subpoena power to get the inside data from the social media companies, and then it was able to provide that data to a group at Oxford University and a New York data analytics firm, and they've done some of the best measurement. But one of the things it showed is if you remember when there was the controversy in the United States about a speech that President Trump gave in Alabama about Colin Kaepernick and the NFL, um, there were two hashtags in the first 48 hours. Uh, one was sort of you know, pro-Trump and the other was pro-Kaepernick. Well, a majority of both hashtags in the first 48 hours emanated from postings that came from Russia. Hmm. And you know, so you have to figure out how to address that, but more broadly, I think it does call into question whether fundamentally is democracy served by such precise targeting? And if democracy is not served, and if democracy is not healthy, what do we do about it? That's a big conversation that I think we're just beginning to consider. Is there any possible, you know, Microsoft's scale and wealth is so substantial and your level of responsibility as evidenced by a number of recent actions is, is pronounced. Is there any way Microsoft itself could get involved in that? In, in, you know, technological antidotes, sort of of the type that Kaifu was mentioning. I mean, do you guys preclude that sort of thing or not? No, I mean, first of all, you know, we're obviously a very diversified company. And as with any business that's diversified, you know, in some places your business is bigger, other places it's smaller, some places it's more of a market leader, in other places it's not. You know, in the social media sphere, we obviously own LinkedIn. So we get some direct exposure to that. One of the great things about working at Microsoft is anytime one of these questions is posed, believe me, there's a very vibrant debate. <laughs> because the people who are in that business are, are perhaps a little more concerned about what it means. And then we also get to think a little bit more broadly as well. Um, we have but, a culture of arguing also. Yeah, <laughs> as a and that's hopefully evolved to more of a, a, a culture of, I'll just say, listening as okay. well as cool. you know, debating. Um, but you know, to take a very practical example, and I think you know, Kai-Fu uh, rightly alluded to it, um, I think we should be pessimistic 
about the ability of technology in the long term to be able to detect deep fakes. We should be. We should be pessimistic about technology's ability to detect deep fakes. But we should be optimistic about technology's ability mm. to protect legitimate media in new mm. ways. Okay. Think about paper <clears throat> money. Anybody with a reasonable bank account you know, can probably find a way to print uh, uh, monies that would be indistinguishable to us. But as a result, there's all kinds of technology now, in effect, literally woven into the currency, the paper, and that is very hard to fake. And so in the same way, you are going to see what, I, you know, what are so-called media provenance ecosystems, so that if techonomy is as it is, filming this and, and broadcasting it, you know, there will be something embedded in the digital data that will be next to impossible, one would hope, for someone to tamper with. So, so that's they, an innovation we need. Exactly. So you know, he, 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 one of the points that Kai Fu makes in his book and has made elsewhere is, you know, we, we shouldn't assume that technology can completely solve every problem, but it is a fundamental tool to counter the weapons. Another thing that I'm struck at this year's Davos uh, uh, regarding technology is, and, and you're both real long-term thinkers and experts on AI, you've both written a lot about it in your books, is this question of bias. And the presumption more and more people are expressing and, and, and wringing their hands about that the, in general, the AI systems we have today that are being pointed at humans are in general biased. That is being said very widely here at Davos by some simply because they're predominantly created by men, which is a logical point. And there's other forms of you know, uh, diversity uh, <coughs> deficits that basically other people point to. I'd like you both to comment on that. Is it as serious a problem as many people think? And, and how do we, I mean, is it just a matter of more education, more hiring pipeline, you know, more corporate enlightenment to hire more diverse teams? But, and, and is it realistic? I wanna hear all of it. <laughs> uh, it's a rather complex issue because I, I, I personally think it's not as bad as, people are, as what people are saying, but it could be a lot better. Uh, why is it not as bad? Because I believe people are a lot more biased, right? We are all familiar with the study that the Isra about Israeli judges, right, who are harsher when they're hungry, right? <laughs> you know, AI systems <laughs> aren't going to be hungry. Uh, and, and AI uh, systems are outcome trained. So AI is less biased in some ways than people. Well, That's what you're saying. Well, no, no. Uh, well, I, I actually believe that, but it's case by case, right? AI is trained by outcome. So, for example, a bank that gives loans, basically you train it by giving loans to people who look like people who pay back and who don't look like people who default. So that ought to be fairly objective and not biased. But at the same time, what if gender or race or age relates to the, correlates to the likelihood of paying back? How do you deal with that? Um, but I, I believe there are solutions to deal with things like that. Uh, for, for example, uh, we could remove the elements that we don't want it to consider. To, that, in our opinion, is, has bias that the society doesn't tolerate, uh, such as gender bias or racial bias. So we could remove those elements. The other thing that could and should be done for the longer term is uh, there should be ways to debug AI programs for bias uh, or for insufficient data. Just like you know, when, uh, when I compile a program, uh, it would say, hey, this part is likely to have... So that's uh, a function that needs to be invented. It's not that hard. Does it exist now? It's not hard. Basically, you just uh, do holdout data and test it and see how well the coverage is and check the number of data you have compared against parameters. There are lots of, one could create a tool that gives warning, but then you need to train the engineers to embed the um, mm -hmm. focus on, on that. Well, you also they... have to alter the culture to put a value on creating the tool. So, yes. you know, and I will say, Microsoft, I believe, is the only one of the major tech companies that has publicly said, you've said, that you have refused to sell certain AI facial recognition systems to certain police agencies because you were quite certain they would be applied in a biased manner. Um, so you have identified it and talked about it publicly. Do you agree with Kai Fu that we can sort of technologize our way out of this problem? 
yeah, I, this is an area where I think there is substantial cause for optimism. And look, I hasten to underscore, Kaifu is an expert on AI. And uh, I have learned a lot by reading what Kaifu has written. And you're a lawyer, we know that. But you but, are the but, president but, of Microsoft. But, but, but the interesting thing is, the first thing you can say about bias is ultimately, it actually is an error. You know, basically, when computer systems make decisions that you know, we would qualify as biased, it often means that they are identifying someone as actually someone they're not. Um, and when we talk about facial recognition, for example, uh, having bias uh, on the basis of gender or people of color, what we're really saying is it has a higher error rate huh. for identifying people from those population groups. Now, I think once you put it in that context, there are a few things that are interesting. First, no customer really wants a system with a high error rate or bias. But a customer can't evaluate that if it cannot be tested. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing is when there have been, for example, facial recognition systems that are testable, graduate students at places like MIT and Stanford have done tremendously helpful work in just documenting the differential error rates and hence the bias in services from different companies. So the first thing that we've advocated for is a law that would say, hey, anybody should be able to participate in the facial recognition market, but if you want to offer your service to the public, you must make it testable. Mm. And then you can allow consumer groups and academic groups and others to, I think, let the market go to work. Now, then ultimately, and, and, and Kai Fu has identified this in various settings, part of the solution then is in getting better data sets, because one of the causes is a bias is data sets that are incomplete, or I'll just say less comprehensive for certain populations. But David, I think you make another really important point, and it's a, a point that we're really trying to you know, drive uh, across the teams at Microsoft. You know, ultimately, if you want to get at the, the root cause of bias, you know, sometimes it's because you have a team that it does not reflect the diversity of the world. You know, and so if you have you know, more women, if you have people from more countries, races and ethnicities and the like, you're more likely to have people who will ask the right questions and will be sensitive to all of these problems. But I do believe that if you let the market go to work and let these things be, be testable in a comprehensive way, you really energize everybody to go solve this problem. Good, thank you both on that one. Uh, I wanna ask you one more question and then I wanna hear from you all with comments and questions. Um, Microsoft is one of the most truly global companies in any industry, certainly a, a major global tech company. Kai Fu, you live in Beijing. I'm gonna talk about US-China relations in tech for a minute. Uh, I actually once went to China with Bill Gates and saw how revered he was there. So I know Microsoft, and I wrote a lot about Microsoft's operations in China, which have been quite extraordinarily successful. But starting with you, Brad, how do you see the current state of play? Because a lot of hand-wringing is happening around the, the future of that relationship. Um, for example, I heard someone here at Davos say uh, that Trump has essentially incented China to develop all its new technologies that have formerly been supplied by the West by his threats of boycotts and his, his sort of fitful uh, regulatory moves. Um, and now they've, got, they've woken up to that. And so now we've really shot ourselves in the foot as the US that we're never gonna have some of those markets in the end. And I think even Microsoft could be negatively affected by that. But how do you, do you worry about that relationship? Well, there are the two largest economies in the world. There are the two probably most powerful governments in the world and everything they do is gonna affect everyone in the world. So we should all care about it. Um, you know, Kai Fu, I think, entitled his book AI Superpowers for a reason. You know, there are two countries that really are the leaders at this point in artificial <coughs> intelligence. Um, I think one of the defining features for the world of technology today is the tension between the United States and China. Uh, you know, as China accounts for 18% of the world's people. China accounts for 1.8% of Microsoft's revenue. And that's really typical of most American tech companies with the exception of Apple and probably uh, Intel and Qualcomm. You know, it, it's you know, welcome to a world of single digit market share. 
And I don't think that's going to change, nor do you see Chinese companies as market leaders in the United States. Uh, and you, while you know, the events of the last few years have certainly been important, you know, the reality is that concern about China may be the single most bipartisan issue in Washington, D.C. today. It's not confined to one administration or one political party. Uh, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with you know, somebody who, until very recently, was one of the most you know, senior uh, uh, members of the United States intelligence community and asked, are we headed for a tech cold war between the United States and China? And the answer I got was, well, I think we're already in one. And that was that person's point of view. I'm not you know, offering an endorsement or a rejection, but you know, that's the prevailing view. And I think in Beijing, I think people have sort of said, yeah, you know, this is a, a long-term issue, and we are a, a government that has a long-term vision. So you know, fundamentally, you have this question in the United States and China. Uh, what does this tension mean? And I think in the rest of the world, and perhaps especially Europe, the question for Europe is, how do we manage this? Um, how do we think about each of these two countries and our relationships uh, with each? And how do we navigate it ourselves with a view to protecting the national security of our information, to ensuring that we have uh, access on a sustained basis to supply of technology? And how do we navigate it in a way that creates economic opportunity for our own businesses, our own startups, our own industries of all sorts. So it really is, I think, one of the defining features of the decade ahead. Hmm. Kaifu, you did subtitle your book, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. That's a pretty big picture statement. Um, how would you characterize that New World Order right now? Um, so first, in my book, the point that I was making is that China has come to its own on the technological progress and is likely to be not only successful within China, but also begin to be quite successful in developing countries, with the U.S. naturally continuing to be uh, dominant in the developed countries. And that was the trend I predicted without considering the geopolitical uh, China-U.S. issues. Now, with those issues, so, so I think in my book, I was looking at a globally competitive market, more countries, more people with more choices, and that is a good thing for the world. I, I did not, I certainly was not making a point that uh, we should have two completely separate universes with no technologies being shared. And, and I think um, the recent um, uh, measures from DC um, make, makes it, uh, more difficult to have that shared platform. And I think I understand the competition, a lot of arguments, and, and the, but what's important is that uh, for users and for developers and for customers and other governments, uh, I, I think more, more options is a good thing and also a, sh a um, uh, accessibility of both technologies from both countries will lead to better prog progress. So I hope the current sentiment that Brad describes doesn't uh, force or cause a faster separation into two completely parallel stack, technical stacks. That really isn't going to be good for the people or for the world. Okay, and I, I do want to go to the audience, but yesterday at lunch, your boss uh, and colleague and close partner Satya Nadella uh, and Larry Fink, uh, as well as Jennifer Morgan of SAP, were interviewed at a Bloomberg lunch. And, and both uh, Satya and, and uh, Larry Fink made some very interesting comments about China. Uh, first of all, Fink said, contrary to the general view, I think, that he believed China would be more integrated with the rest of the world in coming decades because it will increasingly have a need for external capital. And as you need, it, it, the more foreign capital flows into any country, by definition, the more integrated it becomes, which was, that's not the conventional view, but he knows a lot, so that was interesting. On the other hand, Satya said, regarding this issue of um, tech competition, that the more distrust there is, the more it has an impact of slowing global growth generally, and that's really negative. So I just wanted to briefly mm -hmm. mention that. Well, if Eric Brynjolfsson has his hand up, he gets the first question, or comment. No, of course there'll be a question, but, but there's a bit of a comment first. So for, first, 
congratulations, uh, David. This has been the most thoughtful discussion of technology and the economy that I've heard here at Davos, so I'm not surprised. Kudos. I Thank want to pick up on the very first thing. Another speaker at Techonomy, but <laughs> uh, one, one of the first uh, uh, things you brought up was this question of, of fake news, and I really like the analogy Kaifu was making to pollution as an economist. I think that's a great way to think about it. You know, there's externalities. People are imposing costs on other people that they aren't bearing. One of the reasons pollution is a problem is we don't trace back the cost of the people who are creating it. We're trying to fix that with carbon pricing. But you both touched on a possible technological solution, which is you know, content provenance. And my question for you is, why hasn't this happened long ago? You know, with, with uh, public key cryptography, uh, we were able to, when I send my credit card to Amazon or whoever, you know, that's all secure, secure sockets layer. We know that that's the real Amazon. There's a public mm -hmm. key certificate that verifies. I'm not, I don't have to worry that it's a fake Amazon. Why doesn't the New York Times, Techonomy, uh, Fox News, why don't they all have certificates? And I'll mostly focus on, uh, to Microsoft because you can create this kind of infrastructure. You did with commerce. And why are we waiting for, for that to happen? What's, what's the holdup? I don't think it's the technology. A great question, and um, you know, I think whenever the, someone diplomatically asks, you know, why didn't we get smarter sooner, um, you know, it's probably a reminder that we should have gotten smarter sooner. Um, but I, I well, would, you did it pretty yeah, <laughs> and I, I think that you know, I, I would, you know, I'm just sort of thinking aloud in all honesty. But I, I, I would point to two reasons. Um, one has to do with the fact that, uh, that there were some alternative ways to solve the problem. In other words. The quality of the fakes uh, was not so great that you couldn't detect it through alternative means. And it's only when you get to the point where we're now reaching that everybody says, oh my gosh, you know, we're going to have to build a, a, a whole ecosystem to protect this the way we have for other things that could, in effect, be counterfeited or forged so effectively. Uh, the second is, as always, with markets. Um, you, know, you need uh, a certain number of customers to say, you know what, this is something we care about care, and we care enough uh, to actually invest in helping to create it and then we'll deploy it. And you know, right now, uh, I just think that the news media is at a very interesting point. Um, you know, we've seen the business models deteriorate and we've seen um, you know, many, many news outlets just go out of business um, and others sort of live hand to mouth. Um, but, you know, you know, having been on the board of Netflix for five years, I'm struck by the conversation among news media outlets that at least are beginning to ask today, is some of this going to go sort of the direction of, call it, audiovisual entertainment? Uh, you know, where, you know, it really made sense, you know, for a company like Netflix to really double down on the creation of content, build out global distribution, and you know, lead to an environment that people started to see as not winner take all, but you know, winner take a lot, maybe even winner take most. And so now you start to, to see the news media organizations that are doing very well, that start to see a, 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 a place over the horizon where you know, they could be in a more fortunate position. And then you know, it's not surprising that you then start to see those organizations say, gee, if we get to that point, you know, protecting the authenticity of the content that we create is going to be something that we need to invest in. So you have more of a problem that needs new technical solutions, and you have some market actors, at least, I think, reaching a point where they'll say, you know what, that is the kind of thing that we should invest in. We can have that kind of long-term time horizon. And, and in fact, there is some innovation happening around that. A company called NewsGuard in New York, for example, which is cooperating with Facebook and Google, or Google and Facebook and others are cooperating with it and making small incremental steps. Um, OK, somebody back there, and then we'll come up here. Identify Hi. yourself, please. Hi, my name is Rahaf Harfouche. I'm here with HBR France, digital anthropologist. Um, my question to you was more about national AI strategy and some comments about the comments made about competitiveness. I know that countries now are each releasing their own AI strategy that each have their own values of what they want to do in terms of privacy and transparency. And in Europe, with uh, GDPR, one of the values has been consumer privacy. My question to you is on a competitive level globally, 
What happens when you have other countries that are not competing from the same value base? Because one of the biggest pushbacks we've had in Europe is entrepreneurs saying that they're being limited in terms of growth excuse me, by these more um, restrictive data policies. So instead of the, my question is, we talk a lot about AI globally, but what happens to the integrity of the strategy we're trying to implement if the competitor that you're dealing with on a national level, one of the largest superpower AIs, uh, AI superpowers, is themselves playing by a different set of values? I guess you're asking me, okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, Brad and I, another role we play, we're the uh, co-chair of the AI Council of the World Economic Forum. And in that we talk about uh, different uh, AI um, uh, data policies and AI ethics. And, and actually, I'm involved in the, uh, basically the, the, the development of not the AI strategy itself, but the AI data policies and ethics in China. And I'd be happy to share the document with any of you who would like to see it. Uh, it's in the process of being finalized, but there are versions that have come out from the Beijing government and from the Ministry of Science and Technology. Uh, if I just gave it to you without describing where it came from, you, I would, you would have a hard time set, differentiating it from the European document, from the Microsoft principles, from the Google principles. So I actually think there's a much greater set of commonalities among countries. And I think the challenge now is how to turn those principles into uh, enforceable realities. So I actually think um, most of the governments and most of the people want very similar things. There are some differences on um, uh, how national strategies are executed, how they're funded, uh, whether they, they, they have um, uh, real uh, muscle behind it. Though that I think I would separate those issues on the effectiveness and determination to be successful in AI, that's one issue. Uh, and then separately, what are the uh, basically lowest common denominators that we can find among countries? I'm actually optimistic we'll find a reasonable uh, large subset among countries. And I, and I would just say I would build on what Kai-Fu uh, said, and then there's probably a piece where I might have a slightly different point of view. First, think about AI uh, policy, strategy, or ethics horizontally as a set of principles. Uh, around avoiding bias, accountability, having transparency, privacy, safety, and the like. And Kaifu's point is, is really interesting. Uh, if you do a study and you just you compare all of the principles around the world, the amount of similarity is almost what is, is most striking. And that is a, a, a cause of optimism. Um, that's a horizontal view of principles. Then take vertical slices of you know, really use cases of AI. Um, there are many that are not controversial and where you really won't see divergence, and there are some that are. And you know, the first use case that really is the uh, source of controversy around the world is facial recognition. Uh, another one is, is perhaps around you know, the military and lethal autonomous weapon systems and the like. Um, but you know, facial recognition is sort of the flashpoint today. Um, and it's a flashpoint in part because we have these issues of bias, but I think more broadly and, and more long term, it's going to be a flashpoint because of the role it can play in surveillance of populations and its use by governments in a manner that can chill or threaten the right for people to assemble peacefully and express their views. So you naturally are seeing and probably will continue to see governments diverge in how they think about using facial recognition in that way. And then go to the last point that I do think as an American company is important. We will not provide our facial recognition service so that it can be used in a manner that can undermine fundamentally the right of people to assemble. And we have turned down opportunities to provide our facial recognition service to do that. And every time we turn one of those deals down, we deny ourselves the opportunity to collect data that would make our technology better. But I believe it's actually more important for us to serve democracy than to advance technology in that way. We will compete across Western Europe for cities, for capitals, for countries, for facial recognition. 
And there will be days when we compete with companies that come from another part of the world that are serving those authoritarian opportunities. And it is the governments and people of Europe who I believe will decide, do they care enough about this fundamental aspect of democracy to make their purchasing decisions based in part on it? I hope the answer is yes. Well, I, I want to just say one thing about that. At the DLD conference in Munich over the weekend, um, there was a Chinese journalist who was working for a government-affiliated entity who, who actually said she had seen considerable signs in China of citizen pushback against some aspects of facial recognition use in China, which was pretty interesting to hear that said. So please, identify yourself. I'm uh, Jonathan Ruash from a company called Kedit. And I think sitting smack in the middle of those two power, uh, uh, powerful uh, countries. So we are based in Tel Aviv, uh, and we're a bunch of cryptographers doing very advanced cryptography for uh, you know, privacy enhancing techniques. You talked about homomorphic encryption, there's zero knowledge proofs, uh, all of which are useful to track information, uh, supply chain, and uh, so technologies that are very relevant to solve some of the problems that uh, you've mentioned. And sitting at, in Tel Aviv and having investors both from you know, the US and from China, uh, and financial on the Chinese side, VMware on, on the US side. Uh, are you we are forced, in the middle, go on. Are yes. we right, smack in the middle. Are we forced, we, will we be forced to choose sides? Uh, th this this uh, question about Europeans having to pick between you know, the, the goods and the bads, uh, and uh, th this technology being relevant for preserving privacy even uh, you know, on, on the Chinese side, are we heading towards a place where companies that are not one of those superpowers need to pick sides? I don't know whether you will be forced to pick sides, but I think everyone who is creating technology that impacts people's fundamental rights and you know, the enormous advances in, in, in cryptography are among them, must decide what values you want to uphold. I don't myself believe that the world is best served by companies that say that we're prepared to be the arms merchants for the future and we're not going to think about values. So I'm not here to say, you know, pick the ones that I advocate or that someone else advocates, but I am here to say I hope you'll think and I hope that every company everywhere will think about how technology is impacting values that we would argue are timeless. And as much as we care about technology, I might argue that we should perhaps care even more about democracy, about people's fundamental human rights. And you know, in, a, in an industry that was built by computer scientists and engineers, the future is about multiple disciplines. Um, you know, one of the great things that Steve Jobs said, in my view, was that he worked every day at the intersection between engineering and the liberal arts. I think all of us work at that intersection today. Wow, nice way to end. Um, I'm glad this was a very meaty conversation. So <laughs> thank you to both of you, Kai Fu, you. Brad. Uh, thank you very much to Wipro for hosting this event. Uh, we hope you'll come back. We have another breakfast tomorrow morning at 7 on technology and healthcare with one of Brad's colleagues, Greg Moore. Um, keep, enjoy your Davos. Thank you so much. Thanks again, guys. Thank you.